and a wing flap, you know, they, they, they go right through the camera. So we needed at least a crude representation before we could shoot cameras and understand if the, if the co overall composition of the sequence of the choreography worked, worked for us. And it's not really illustrated in that clip, but one of the benefits of having this real-time playback is that the performer on the Banshee can see the path, can see the flight path. So we can take that POV and, and give them that virtual ride on the Banshee based on the original layout that was done. So they know when a dive's coming up, when a bank's coming up, and they can respond accordingly. Because the logic behind the relationship between the Banshee and the rider is that in, in, in Pandora, the, the Navis were actually controlling Creatures. So they were actually a step ahead of where the creatures would go. Think of it like reins, uh, the reins on a horse. That's pretty much the way it was, uh, it was meant to be. The, the signal goes out before it. Right, so it was subtle, but it, it, Jim really wanted to show that, that, that the riders were very much at ease with the creatures because they had full control. And that was a big part of the story. And having that visual feedback for the performers was critical in creating that dynamic. And to be honest, up to this, whenever we've, uh, we've had to use captured motion for flight dynamics in the past to produce final shots, you were dependent on a hit and miss kind of a situation where the rider has to be, uh, have his weight in the right place. It wasn't always, uh, it wasn't always shot correctly, then you'd have to edit the motion heavily. Whereas this, we were able to get to a point where we, we, we knew we had the banks in the right place and therefore the weight was on the right side. And so the physics of it all hold together. Uh, another important part of what we were trying to do, we were trying to, we, we were selling the audience on, on a surreal world, so we had to ground it in some reality. So, uh, you know, basic physics became a huge part of, of, of our daily routine. So once we had those performances selected, we assembled the, the rider performance, the base banshee performance of the, the flight path, and then the wing flapping neck motion, and even some layered animation on the creature on top of that to create one fluid sequence. And so, Here's the results of all that work in addition to some incredible rendering and lighting effects from our front of weather. You'll see from the, the, the first clip is the uh, practical element of So there's many, there was many layers to this. Ruben is a stone performer, and then we had uh, Sam acted out as well for a facial performance. There you go. So they were combined in different ways. Uh, we built individual loads uh, depending on, on, on which piece of the puzzle we needed. And then it would it would become a template form. Uh, so we would shoot the cameras. This is our first attempt to drive the camera uh, with the creature that is. So we stitched the, those motions together, and we were able to go out on stage with a virtual camera as if this action was actually happening in front of you, and have a, a, a truly interactive way to shoot shoot it. 
From there, then we had to go to an animator, for a, a fully fledged animation stage. Once we had this rough animation, or you know, a rough blocking, plus a camera, we'd, we'd send it down to Wada. Just a quick comment. You can see this camera motion is much more frenetic, uh, really, to, to coincide with the stress that Jake is under. That's something that's very difficult to do with keyframes. So, again, played a big role having a virtual camera there for Jim to really dictate that relationship between how the shot is viewed and the action is really important. Yeah, I think it can be done in, in keyframe. It just isn't organic. It just isn't interactive. So this is the animation paths as we start to get into the creature. We see the sort of the deformation of the creature itself and sort of some of the, the, uh, the pieces of, the, of, I think, the more flushed out animation with the alulas and all the wings and kind of understand what is in and out of frame. And then we would augment the cameras very, very slightly then, but we knew the essence of what you wanted. So we, we could take, make an augmented camera, show it to him, make sure it had the same feel and all the same essence were there. And then uh, we went to final round. We've been a little flippy about the final round, by the way. It's like, and then we, there's a whole other section of the post production kind of presentation. I think that uh, we're not going to cover it today. We can ask questions, but we're not. Uh, that's a whole other uh, two years. So, uh, questions about the animation library before we move on, or are the fancy ready? Okay. So. Uh, broader question, um, which is, uh, The Economist did a story about the amazing work that you're doing, and they equated it to um, performance capture is doing, could do for television and movie making what black and white switch to color did. And just want to get your views, do you agree, disagree with that statement, and, and why? Yeah, I think it's, it's also been equated to uh, sort of the advent of sound, but I don't, I think that the, the advent of color is, is a much better analogy. Um, because ultimately, you know, it's, it's this in conjunction with 3D, you know, uh, we'll see obviously a lot of 3D, it'll creep in across, across broadcast television. It won't, I don't think it will be blanketly available, it's not going to just be like sound, everything switches over to talkies within, you know, a very short period of time. It will sort of, you know, depending on, on the material that's available for broadcast, uh, you know, it's probably going to start with sport uh, on, a, on a 3D level. And then you'll see more and more CG. CG, by the nature of it, is a given for 3D. If you make a movie in CG, you'd be crazy not to be putting out a 3D version of it. You have a displacement of a camera which produces an IO, and then you re-render, so you have two renders. And so it's all there for you to do. And live action is a, is a uh, on television, that's a different issue. Now you're, you're, you, you, know, you have the practical element of bringing 3D cameras to set. Um, but again, the, the virtual production side of things, I think that will, again, it will trickle down slowly. It'll start, it will start, it'll, it'll, sustain uh, big tentpole movies only for, for a couple of years and then I think you'll see it creep into uh, TV shows and uh, even like, we looked at uh, the ORAD yesterday over at, uh, at Turner I mean you can already see you know sort of instant animation and multi-layering uh, happening in broadcast pro pro television if you look at sport shows it's incredibly prevalent with, you know already so it's, it's happening you know? and I think that there's no question that the interactive component can help facilitate a production because you can make faster decisions, make changes on the fly, and have a true collaboration on a stage, instead of sending it back to a bunch of different offices and seeing renders the next day, and then making comments on those renders. So we, we are kind of rearranging that cyclical process of animation and effects, and trying to make it more interactive in general, which should help you know, TV shows, films, commercials, all the different forms of media. But uh, a lot of it also depends on the back end and the final look. You know, what you're seeing here and what we've been calling the template is kind of a game quality level of rendering. And, and what's really exciting now, though, is the, the level of, of real-time rendering or just near-time rendering it is, is grown leaps and bounds, even in the last few years, from where it was even when we started. So there's, there's a big opportunity for shows that can use that level of rendering. Avatar is still really at, you know, at the peak in terms of the... Uh, the demands, technically. And so there's still a, a lot of bandwidth needed in terms of labor and time to, to get to that final level. 
that you can... Yeah, photoreal is not easy to... But, uh, but uh, if you take like the first Toy Story, for example, the very first one, we're very close now to being able to do that in real time. And so yeah, that's, that's really cool. exciting. So that really opens up a lot of possibilities for broadcast for television. Yeah, and it doesn't necessarily say it will get cheaper. I think it just means that the resources would end up in different places, and I think more money will, in some ways will end up on screen. You know, there's again, the more you can reduce the editing process and changes that happen in shows, uh, the, the, the better the quality of the image that ends up on screen. We're actually doing a show right now at a Giant in LA, and the company came to us for a film, and they said, "Look, we tried something else that didn't work. We don't have a lot of money." Can you help us? And so we, we street, you know, pulled it back and just gave them baseline performance capture, real time, and a, and a camera 